Well, yeah, it's great to be here with you. I feel like I'm kind of a bit of a son of the house because, as uh, as Cass said, uh, we're from Murray Bridge, and uh, I got saved in the Murray Bridge Church 20 years ago, and uh, that church would not be in existence if this church hadn't been a sowing and investing church, uh, sowing and investing pastor Ray Betcher, who uh, started this church and then went up and started that church. So uh, I feel like I'm home, I'm among family, and uh, so we're going to have a great uh, morning this morning, and uh, hopefully we'll get to know each other a bit better as, as the morning goes on. Uh, one of the interesting things... Uh, that I share in common with Cass is that we have the same wedding anniversary. That's right, isn't it? So coming up in just a few weeks' time, it's our 18th wedding anniversary. And um, the thing is, is that um, we haven't, uh, my wife and I haven't been able to have uh, kids of our own, um, but we're always surrounded by kids. I was a, a primary school teacher uh, for many years, and uh, our church is, is full of kids and full of life, and so it's great to, to be around uh, kids. And even yesterday, we had a little four-year-old come over to stay, and um, she was asking a million and one questions. I don't know if parents are familiar with this, but I actually looked up a study, and they said that the average mother, if there is such a thing as an average mother, there's no such thing as an average mother. Is that right, mothers? You're not average. But if there is an average mother, she gets asked 300 questions a day. So the average, the average kid asks about 125 questions a day, but um, the average adult only asks six. So as we go on, we ask less and less questions. But those six questions, I think, are vitally important. You see, we can't there's a whole bunch of things in our life that we can't control. We know that, don't we? There's situations and circumstances that, that come up that are not in our control, but the questions that we ask are in our control. And so the rhythm of our life as we begin this new year and a new decade, that there's a, there's a rhythm that gets set up to our life and that is uh, governed by the questions that we ask. And so if we only get six questions a day, then we want to make sure that those six questions that we're asking are amazing questions that are going to lead us and, and reset us as we're in this reset series, are going to reset our life so that we're on track with where God is leading us and we're, we're marching to the, to the rhythm and to the beat that He wants to set for our lives. And so this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to ask, we are going to ask six questions. And three of those questions are going to be questions that we should never ask. And three are going to be ones that we should ask every day. Because if we've only got six, it's different to kids. Kids, if they get 125 questions a day, they can ask all sorts of questions that don't necessarily mean anything and that you're never going to find an answer to. Questions that they have like, why doesn't the glue stick to the inside of the bottle? Questions like, do fish get thirsty? Do penguins have knees? What is the Roman numeral for zero? Who knows the answer? If you are at the South Pole and you start to dig a hole, are you digging down or digging up? If you treat a cow really, really well, do you get spoiled milk? <laughs> How do you know that honesty is the best policy unless you've tried all the others? Should we go to church today? And that one's not a funny one, but that is the first question that we should not ask. That if our kids or we are asking that question, it means that something has gone wrong with the rhythm of our life. That, that, that today, hopefully, we're, as we are thinking about what it means to reset our life and to reset our life in God's, uh, you know, the direction that God wants to take us for this year, that that should actually never be a question that we should ask. Are we going to church today? You see... Anyone here in love? Anyone here in love? Hopefully all the married people. If, you're not, if your hand's not up, you're going to be in serious trouble. Now, remember when you, when you first fell in love, you know, there's a phrase that sometimes people have. They, they say, oh, my, my heart skipped a beat. You know, you know what they say? 
And so that's kind of good if your heart skips one beat, but if your heart skips too many beats, it can be fatal. That there's a rhythm that your heart should have, and if it doesn't stick to that rhythm, then it can be fatal. And so, too, with our relationship with God, God says that there should be a rhythm that is set up that, that establishes our relationship, that we should actually be, you know, regular, regularly attending church. That just as if our heart skips too many beats, it can be fatal. If we skip our relationship, if we skip spending time with God and prioritizing Him, it can be fatal to our spiritual walk. So we want to make sure that we're prioritizing God and His works and His ways. Hebrews 10, 25 says, This is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together, as some have formed the habit of doing, because we need each other. In fact, we should come together even more frequently, eager to encourage and urge each other onward. So some back then had formed a habit of not meeting together. That slipped into this wrong pattern, this wrong way of thinking, this wrong rhythm had been established in their lives. And as we start 2020, we want to make sure that we are not just setting New Year's resolutions, but that we are actually setting healthy habits, that we are setting good habits, that we are setting good rhythms that our lives can work towards. And the specific title for, for this week, for this series, is Rhythms of Grace. That that is the rhythm that God wants our life to be set by, this rhythm of grace. Now, grace is not a natural thing. Grace is a lovely thing. It's a, it's a beautiful thing, but it's kind of, to us human beings, it's not, a, it's not a natural thing. We are justice people. And if this life is all that there is, if there is no eternity, if there is nothing more, then our, the rhythm of our life that is going to be set is one of selfishness and what we can get out of life. And so we're never going to show grace to anyone else. Our life isn't going to be marked by the rhythm of grace. Just as, you know, when it's worship time, you know, Nathan led us so amazingly in worship. And I'm sure that in a room this size, there's some of you that when it comes time to clap, you kind of don't really know when to clap. Is that anyone in the room? Anyone finds it hard to clap? Yeah, yeah, I see a few little hands going up. Now, if clapping was all that there was, you see, there's this thing that happens. Some people clap on two and four, and some people clap on one and three. I don't know if you've seen this, and it can be very off-putting if you're clapping on two and four and someone else is clapping on one and three. And the thing is, is that if clapping was all that there was, if there was no band, there was no singers, there was no anything else, then of course you would have to clap on one and three because you have to set the beat. You have to set the, the, the rhythm. You clap on one and three. But when there is a band and they are the ones that are leading, they are the ones setting the rhythm, then we all clap on two and four because the band leads and we follow. And so it is with grace. That if this life is all there is, we will clap on one and three. That is the natural thing that we will do. We will be led by that rhythm and that rhythm will dictate our lives. But when there is more, when the grace of God does come upon us, then God says we are to let grace lead. And when grace sets the rhythm and we fall in behind that, that's how our lives are going to grow and flourish. And that's how we're going to reset the rhythm of our life as we approach this new decade. This term rhythm of grace comes from the very words of Jesus in, uh, in Matthew in the, in the message version. He says this, Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. 
So you notice even rest is not something that comes natural to us. It's something that we have to learn, that we have to go to God to learn. He says, come to me and learn the unforced rhythms of grace. That it's something that we need to to focus on and, and catch his rhythm. And some of you, when I said about, you know, making sure that you don't skip church or you know if we're asking that question we're asking the wrong question some of you are probably thinking well that sounds a bit legalistic Josh like we don't have to come to church every week surely you know in the old covenant they had the ten commandments and they had to follow the law and we know that one of the laws in the ten commandments as we read in Exodus 20 verse 8 says remember the day of worship by observing it as a holy day So we think, well, that's old covenant, that's the law. Of course, they had to, you know, they had all these rules and laws around how they were to observe the Sabbath and how they were to keep it. So we don't want to go back to that old covenant. We don't want to go back to the law. But we need to understand what God was trying to achieve by giving the Israelites the law. You see, they'd just come out of 400 years of slavery. The rhythm of their life had been set to work to strive. Each and every day they would get up, it was the same, that they would make bricks, they would make bricks, they would make bricks. And so as God calls them out of Egypt, he gives them these 10 commandments and one of them is to observe a Sabbath day. Now, being a pastor, Sundays are often a work day for me. And so my wife and I, we take Wednesday as a day off. Now, when we first started this practice about six years ago, my wife came to me every Wednesday with a list of jobs that she wanted me to do. So I said, this this is not what this is supposed to be. I work all the other days, and now this is just more work just in a different location. But this is not what it was supposed to be. So we've actually relabeled that day, date day. Because I want that day to be a day of intimacy with me and my wife. And so really this Sabbath rule, this this was, was supposed to not be a duty. It was supposed to be a delight. It was like God saying... I, I, I want to be intimate with you. I want, I want time with you. I want, I want to be the focus of your attention. I want one day out of every seven for us to be together. You see, the universe was set up with a rhythm. That every time the earth spins around once, that's a day. That every time the moon spins around the, the earth, that's a month. That every time the earth spins around the sun, that's a year. Everything is set up to, to have a rhythm, to have a pace to it. There's no reason to have a week other than the fact that God set the weeks in motion because he wants to spend time with you. He wants that to be the rhythm of your life. That what we do every Sunday is it's like your leaders, your worship leaders are setting a table before you. They're, they're preparing a meal. They're, they're lighting the candles. They're, they're doing all this so that it's like we have this date day, this intimacy with God. It was never supposed to be a duty. It was always supposed to be a delight. I have uh, three brothers, one older and and two younger. And growing up, uh, my older brother, he would never eat his fruit and vegetables. It was just meat and carbs, carbs and meat, meat and carbs, all day, every day. Then he started dating this vegetarian. (laughs) Eventually they got married. And so... The question that he was asking initially was, can I have some more meat, mum? But then I noticed, you know, after he'd been married for about a year, they didn't eat any meat in their home. And so every time that he would come to to our place, the question had changed to be, can I please have some meat? (laughs) 
But then after about five years, the question changed again. And now he simply says, can you please pass the kale? (laughs) It's a a very sad thing. But the reality is, is that we actually get hungry for what we consume. That if we are living our lives consumed by the entertainment that the world has to offer, we will always be full of those things. There will always be opportunity to do something else on a Sunday. The world is providing more and more opportunities for you and you can get full on what the world has to offer. But my brother, despite what, you know, the the joke that I was kind of making, my brother is actually fitter and healthier than he has ever been in his life because his taste has changed, because we get hungry for what we consume. So I want us to be a people that are so hungry for the things of God. That, that so desire, that, that love and that intimacy with God. And that as we start to do that, because maybe it, it, you are like my brother after that, that first year. Maybe you are still kind of hungering for the things of the world. And you think, well, this grace thing isn't natural to me. This grace thing, maybe it's just not me. It's not who I am. I'm, I'm really struggling with this idea. I'm really struggling with, 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 with this idea of, of grace and coming to church and reading my Bible. I don't know how to do it. But can I encourage you to hang in there, to make that choice, to start just consuming the, the Word of God, to start you know, your, your prayer time, to start... you know doing your your Bible reading plan because I can guarantee you that by the end of this decade, if you do that, that you're going to be fitter and healthier in your spiritual walk, that you're going to start to be hungry for the things of God and for His love and His presence. So the first question was, are we going to church? That was the wrong question. So the right question then is, what can I do to deepen my intimacy with God today? So we want to replace that question with that new question. What can I do to deepen my intimacy? And being here in church is something that is so vitally important. You see, they've done studies, and uh, you've probably heard that the way that we think, they can measure the brain waves, that there's, that there's waves, there's a, there's a wavelength. So there's a rhythm to the way that we think. And they can measure the brain waves, and when we're angry, it's a certain frequency. There's a certain rhythm to our thoughts when we are angry. When we are anxious, there's a certain rhythm, there's a certain wavelength, there's a certain frequency that our mind goes on. And when we're at peace, when we feel joy, there's another frequency, there's another wavelength. And what they have discovered is that when you get in a room with people, And when you experience what they experience, even if you've come into that room full of fear, full of anxiety, full of worry, that as you get into a room with other people, that that, that their wavelength is one of peace, that the rhythm of your brainwaves will actually change to match the people that you are sitting next to. So that is why it is so important that God doesn't want us to just form a habit of not coming to church, that it should ever be a question in our mind, are we going to church today? No, he wants us to say, I, I need to be in the house of God. I'm so desperate to be in the house of God. I, I so desperately need to be around those people that are going to lift me up, that though I may walk in there full of anger, full of anxiety, full of all this, I know that when I come into that place and when the Holy Spirit is there, because it's not just each other, that when we come into this place, the Holy Spirit is here and His thoughts are higher than our thoughts and His ways are higher than our ways. And so all of a sudden, our thinking starts to align with His way of thinking. And that that is now going to set the rhythm of our life. So our third question is a wrong one that Peter asks. He says to Jesus, read this thing of forgiveness. When is it enough? When is it enough? How much is, is enough forgiveness to have? We're going to read the account in Matthew 18. He said, and then Peter approached him with this question. He said, Master, how many times can my brother wrong me and I must forgive him? Would seven times be enough? No, 
Jesus replied. Not seven times, but 70 times seven. So you see, put yourself, I always like to, to put myself in the shoes of, you know, the people that were there. So I put myself in Peter's shoes and I think, yeah, okay, I'm starting to get the hang of this new rhythm, this, this new rhythm of grace. I see that there's seven, you know, every seven days where to stop, where to be intimate with you, where to have this date day with you, this Sabbath with you. That in the beginning you created the earth on six days and that on the seventh you rested. You were trying to set that, that pattern up from the beginning. So when it comes to forgiveness, I know that in the past we've had this rule, that the Jews had this rule of, you know, forgiving someone three times in a day if they wrong you. So it's like, okay, well, that's the law. I know that grace is beyond the law. I see this pattern of seven. So I think, I think, yep, I think I've got the rhythm. I think I've got the rhythm of grace now, Jesus. I think, should I forgive someone seven times? And I bet he was as proud as Pudge, like, I've got it. I've got, I've got the rhythm. I'm clapping in time. And Jesus is like, no. Nah. No. 70 times seven. Now, does that mean that he wanted Peter to sit there and count and on the 491st time that he wasn't to forgive? No, what, what Jesus is saying is, is that when you get into the rhythm of grace, that when it comes to forgiveness, you won't ask, ask the question anymore, when is it enough? Because all of a sudden you'll see that, that forgiveness is not about keeping score, it's about losing count. that you'll stop keeping count, that you'll stop keeping account of the times that you were wronged. You'll stop keeping account and score of where this person is on their ledger against you. you stop keeping count and keeping score about whether that person deserves forgiveness or not. Because the thing is that as Christians, forgiveness is not just something that we should do, it should be who we are. That we are the forgiven of the Lord. And that if we are the forgiven, then forgiveness should flow out of us. If we've stepped into that rhythm of being forgiven, then forgiveness is something that should flow from us. Now, as you can probably tell, I'm not an athlete. But athletes um, have this phrase that they like to, to say, that they, they say that they're developing muscle memory. I don't know if you've heard this. So they're not just developing muscle, but they're developing muscle memory. And probably one of the only sports that, you know, now that I'm in my 40s and I feel really old, um, one of the only sports that I continue to do is, uh, is uh, water skiing. We live on the, on the Murray River. And um, so I like to go out water skiing. And um, when I ask my, my friend, because, you know, if you go water skiing a lot, you, your body starts to hurt, it starts to ache. And so I asked my friend, like, what are some of the best exercises or activities that I can do to make sure that, uh, you know, my body's ready for water skiing? And he says, all right, I'll give you an activity. This is, this is the exercise that you need to do. And I said, just that, just putting my arms down, just, just going like that. Any weights in, the, in your hand or whatever? He's like, no, just do that. I said, why, you know... I felt a bit like being taught by Mr. Miyagi, you know, like, just, just do this, just do this. And the thing was, he said, well, that's creating muscle memory. That the biggest thing that happens when you're water skiing is because you have a boat trying to pull your arms and your body in that direction, generally what tends to happen is you lift your arms up and you break at your waist and you let the boat pull you forward and then your form is gone. So if your body knows to be upright with your arms down, that because there's 60,000 other things to think about, when the pressure comes, if you've been practicing and you've been creating this muscle memory, your body knows the exact position to go into without you thinking about it. So when the pressure comes, you can do that. And maybe you've seen basketballers without a ball in their hand just practicing doing like that. They're creating muscle memory of the motion without the pressure of the ball in their hand. Or you've seen drummers, you know, sit there just tapping their, their leg or doing whatever 
trying to create a muscle memory of the beat. We, we do it all the time. We create this, this muscle memory so that when game day comes, we know how to perform, when the pressure comes on. So I think this idea with, with forgiveness, that God wants us to create this muscle memory. He wants us to create this rhythm of forgiveness in our lives. So we can practice with the small things. When someone cuts you off in traffic, forgiving them. When your kid spills their drink on the brand new rug, forgive them. When your co-worker, you know, maybe takes credit for the idea that was yours. Because then when the pressure comes, if, if we've gotten used to what to do with little or no pressure, then when the big things of life come, if we've set up this rhythm of grace, this rhythm of forgiveness in all that we do, then when a family member betrays us, when someone at work, you know, really does us out of a lot of money, gets us fired, when our spouse lets us down, breaks our trust, when the things of life happen, when the pressures of life, when it is game day, when it counts, when the pressure comes on, we're going to know what to do and we're just going to go, yep, I'm going to forgive. I'm going to surrender. I'm going to, I'm going to forgive that person. You see, because it doesn't just impact, forgiveness doesn't just impact our relationship with that other person. It impacts our relationship with God. You see, all of you have used some form of muscle memory to get here in your cars today. That you drove along roads that you've been on a hundred, a thousand times before. And you probably know, well, you know, this road is 50, this road is 60, this road is 80, but you didn't drive along constantly looking at your speedo to make sure that you were going the right speed. Because you've used muscle memory, you, you probably went the same speed today as what you did yesterday or last week and the week before that and the week before that. Now, for me, as I was coming here today, as I rounded the, sort of the corner from Tapley's Hill onto Henley Beach Road, there was a police car that was there. Now, because I have tried my best to create a, a muscle memory, a rhythm to my life where I don't speed, when I saw that police car, my mind didn't go, oh, you know, it's a police car, I'm really worried. No, I knew that because there was a police car there, it meant that all the other road users were going to be obeying the law. So me seeing that police car, when I've set up my rhythm right, when I've created the right muscle memory in my life, when I see the, the image of that police car, the closer it is, the safer I feel and the more peace I feel. But conversely, if you've created a muscle memory of you're always running late and so you're always speeding, you know that you are always 10 kilometers an hour over the speed limit. You see that same cop car, your reaction is going to be very different. It's going to be fear and anxiety and dread for fear of punishment of the law. And so if we use that analogy, if God is like that policeman, then how do you feel as God starts to approach in your life? Do you feel peace and safety the closer he comes? Or do you feel fear and anxiety and waiting for the punishment of the law to come upon you? And if, if you're feeling that, that weight of the law, if, if there's an anxiety, any, any hint of anxiety that comes upon you as God starts to draw close to you, then can I encourage you to change the rhythm of your life? 
to, set, to make sure that you're setting your life by the rhythm of grace. Because when you're setting your life by the rhythm of grace, all of a sudden, you want to approach God. You can't wait for Him to be near. You don't want to go back to that place of, of unforgiveness. You don't want to be, be sitting there keeping tally and keeping score and, and doing all that kind of stuff. Because as soon as God approaches you, if you're living your life with unforgiveness towards that person and how that person hurt me and how that person hurt you, then when God approaches you, we all know deep down that we are sinners, that we've got stuff against God. But when we've received of His grace, all of a sudden, as His presence comes, we feel more safety, more calm, and we'll move towards Him rather than away from Him. That is what God wants for us. That as we move towards our 2020, and the decade that is to come. God doesn't want us constantly looking to the law, looking at the speedo. He wants us eyes up. He's saying to you, congregation, lift your eyes up. Have your eyes on the road. Get a, get a dream. Get a picture of, of the future. I don't want your eyes down. I don't want your eyes looking at the law, you know, trying to keep count and keep score of who's done wrong against you and who's done this and who's done that. No, I want your eyes up on the road, on the future. That it's not about keeping score. It's about losing count with this idea of forgiveness. That in the area of forgiveness and in joy and in hope and in patience and all these other virtues... That God doesn't want us to keep count with those things. He wants our life to be limitless. He wants us to look towards the limitless horizon and go towards that. And this is what it says in Galatians 5. It says, The fruit that is produced by the Holy Spirit within you is divine love in all its varied, in all its varied expressions. Joy that overflows. Peace that subdues. Patience that endures. Kindness in action. A life full of virtue, faith that prevails, gentleness of heart, and strength of spirit. Never set the law above these qualities, for they are meant to be limitless. They are meant to be limitless. They are, they are to be where our attention is. On the limitless joy and peace and patience and all those things that God promises us, that when we allow the Holy Spirit to set the rhythm of our life... That is where our attention and focus is going to be. Not on the law and are we enough and how have they done wrong and keeping score and keeping account. So the question is not, when is it enough? Have I done enough forgiveness? But rather the question that we should be asking is how can my life reflect the limitless love forgiveness and grace of God if we swap those two questions around it's going to set us up for a life of grace in 2020 and the final set of questions that we're going to replace the final bad one comes from the gospel of Luke when someone comes up to Jesus and says this good teacher what must I do to deserve eternal life. So we can have Jesus right in front of us, but we can still ask the wrong question. Because sadly, there is nothing we can do to ever deserve eternal life. Eternal life does not flow from us, from our good deeds, from our prayers, from following instructions. No matter how good you try to follow them, you will never deserve eternal life. Romans 15 says this, Whatever was written beforehand is meant to instruct you how to live. The scriptures impart to us encouragement and inspiration so that we can live lives of hope and endure all things. Now may God, the source of great endurance and comfort, Grace you with unity among yourselves, which flows from your relationship with Jesus, the anointed one. So yes, the law is there. It's there for encouragement. It's there, you know, for those different things. But life and life eternal, grace flows from Jesus. 
So if we ask the wrong question, what must I do to inherit, to deserve eternal life, we're always going to come up with the wrong answer. And just recently, just in the last uh, week or two, I had a lady from my church come to me and she said, Pastor Josh, I, I have a question. She said, this question has, has kept me up night after night. I've been awake for, for the last few weeks. I've been trying to answer this question, but I can't. And so I'm, I'm coming to you. I want you to help me answer this question. She said, I have an elderly father. He has emphysema from smoking too much and he's on his deathbed. He's, he's wheezing and it, it breaks my heart. Every, every breath that he takes is just a struggle. But he's not a Christian. So she said, my, my question is, should I want him to live or die? Because he's in pain now. And I have to see him take those breaths and I have to see him labor for those things. So, but, but he's, he's not a Christian. And so I know that if he does go, well, what does that mean for him eternally? And, and so I've been trying to answer this question, but I just can't answer it. And I said to her, that's because... You're not meant to answer it. That's because it's not your question to ask. You see, I encouraged her. I said, what you are doing is you are assuming the place of God. You are trying to go back to that striving and that work and that effort and that it all comes down to you. You think that you hold the power of death and life in your hands and in your prayers. But can't we be thankful that life doesn't flow from us, that we don't have to ask that question, that, that life and life eternal flows from Jesus? And that we can entrust that question, we can entrust his life to him. That yes, we can pray for his salvation. We can pray that he has an encounter with the living God. That just as God, right in the very beginning, took the dust from the ground and breathed into it and brought about creation, that he can still, he is still the God who saves. He's still the God who heals. He's still the God who creates. And so one breath from God will, will cause your father's lungs to, to breathe again. So we can pray and we can believe for that. But you see, God didn't want her to be living in this place of condemnation. He doesn't want any of us to be living in this place of condemnation. Because it, no matter what answer I was to give her to that question that she asked, she was going to end up in a place of condemnation. Because if he had have lived and suffered, she would have felt condemned because it was her decision. And if he died, she would have felt condemned because her father had not received Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And so if the rhythm of our question is leading us towards a place of condemnation, we know that that should be a, not a question that we should ever ask. Because God never leads us to a place. He never sets a rhythm of guilt and shame and condemnation. The Bible says there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So therefore we need to stop asking the wrong questions and getting the wrong answers. So the question then becomes, not good teacher, what must I do to deserve eternal life? The question is, how can I ever thank you enough for the undeserved gift of eternal life? You see, if we ask the first question, what must I do? There is nothing you can do. 
The bad news is that there is nothing you can do that will cause you to deserve eternal life. But the good news, the great news, the wonderful news of the gospel is that there is nothing you need do because everything that needed to be done by you was done by Jesus on the cross. And so now all we have to do is receive. We don't have to to do, it was done. And some of you may think, well, Josh, even this question, how can I ever thank you enough? We ca- I can't. I-, I can't ever thank him enough. Josh, it's, it's like asking that question, what do you get for the person who already has everything? And this is God, so he really has everything. But this whole thing, the whole reason that Jesus came, the whole, the whole reason that you know, he calls us, to this living this life of forgiveness, of setting this rhythm of grace in our life is because he wants you. That there is one thing that he won't have if you don't let him. And that's you. That's your heart. And that's what he wants. That's why he set up the Sabbath. That's why he sent his son Jesus. And that's why he calls us to this place of repentance and forgiveness and to live lives of grace because then and only then can we give him what he truly desires. And each and every one of us have an opportunity to do that this morning. So we're going to stand and I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And if you've allowed unforgiveness to set the rhythm of your life if you've been keeping score about how everyone has wronged you then this morning you have an opportunity to set a new rhythm to reset your life to reset this decade and say no more am I going to allow fear and shame and guilt and condemnation to dictate the rhythm of my life that Josh I I feel exactly like you were talking about with that police car. I feel like as soon as I see God coming, that I want to run the other way, that that I fear that I'm not good enough, that I've got this unforgiveness in my heart. And and, and Josh, I, I, I I long for the day when... I could see God coming and I could want to move towards Him. I want to feel that peace. I want to feel that joy that you were talking about. I want to feel that safety and that security that comes from being in His arms. What do I need to do? Well, all we need to do is surrender to Him. All we need to do is say, yes, God. I let go of my guilt. I let go of my shame. I let go of my unforgiveness. And I allow your Holy Spirit to come and set a rhythm of grace and forgiveness over my life that it may then flow to those around and about me. So dear Heavenly Father, we just, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace that it is not something that we could ever deserve. But we thank you this morning that it is available to us. Father, for those that are carrying the weight, the heavy weight of unforgiveness, for the people that have hurt us, the people that have wronged us, the people that have let us down and not measured up to our standard. Father, as we think now of the cross and what you went through for us to purchase forgiveness for us, to impart forgiveness to us, Lord, as we receive of your forgiveness, Lord, help us to then show forgiveness to others. Father, we need your Holy Spirit 
to be setting the rhythm, setting the agenda for our lives. So, Lord, we, we lay down our right to unforgiveness so that we may pick up your grace. We receive of your grace. We receive of your love. We receive of your mercy. Father, we thank you that although grace is unnatural to us, although we want to hold on to that bitterness, hold on to that hurt, Father, we thank you that you are setting a new rhythm in our lives right now, that we can come boldly to your throne of grace. And we receive of you and your love and your peace and your mercy now. We receive of your eternal life. If there is anyone here who has not yet called upon Jesus to be their Lord and Saviour, that have feared the punishment of the law, I pray that this morning that they would see and know that God didn't come to exact the law upon you, that God came to set you free, to bring his peace, and that this morning you would make that decision to lay down your life and pick up his grace. It is there, it is waiting, it is available for each and every one of us, whether it is our first time in church or whether we've been here for the last 40 years. We thank you that for each and every one of us, your grace is available, your forgiveness is available to us today as we choose to receive it and we choose to forgive those who have wronged and hurt us.